good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this beautiful fall day, just before the, uh, the midterm elections that we're going to be talking about today. I'm, I'm Jacob Hacker. I direct the Institution for Social and Policy Studies. Uh, the building in which uh, you are now located is the, is the home of the center. Um, and I'm really pleased that we have uh, a distinguished panel to talk about the elections. Um, before I start, I want to offer some thanks. Um, I want to thank first the Pointer Institute for Journalism, which made it possible for us to bring in Natalie Jackson, uh, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, I'd like to thank Pam Green for the heroic efforts she made to make this work, despite the fact that we caused her a little bit of a heart attack uh, by saying at the end that we wanted to just blast out more invites. And she said, oh my god, will we have too many people, not enough food, people in the aisle? And I said, that's good. Um, it's good when you run out of food. It's good when you have people in the aisle. And so feel free to eat up. Um, and then finally, um, I want to thank our panelists. And I'll introduce them. My goal uh, is to say as little as possible here, um, which if, for those of you who know me is difficult. Um, so I will, um, I'll try to I'll try to restrain myself um, and introduce our really distinguished panelists um, from right to left. There's no political meaning implied here. Um, we have David Mayhew. Um, he's uh, someone who needs no introduction, but as one of my less modest mentors said, needs no introduction, but always appreciates one. Um, so he is a distinguished scholar of Congress. He's a Sterling professor, which is a very big deal. He's the author of so many books, I can't possibly name them, um, but his dis his his um, tenure book, the book that got him tenure, was Congress, The Electoral Connection, which continues to sell thousands of copies a year and is probably the most influential book uh, written on Congress uh, in the modern era. Um, Woodrow Wilson, I think, might you know, have a little bit of a, a, little bit of a ch challenge to him if you go back farther. Um, and, uh, no, he did not know Woodrow Wilson, um, though <laughs> he probably knows exactly the election returns of Woodrow Wilson in every state uh, of the Union. Okay, so uh, moving uh, to the left, uh, we have Eitan Hirsch. Uh, Eitan is our, uh, is our young election guru. Um, he is uh, not only a distinguished scholar, but also someone who has been very adept at getting um, access to and involved with uh, political campaigns, uh, not as an advocate, but as an analyst. Um, one of the great um, achievements is uh, his work in bringing to, uh, to political scientists Catalyst, which you may talk a little bit about it, which is the Democrats Get Out the Vote database. Uh, it's pretty remarkable, and it includes uh, all registered uh, uh, voters in the United States, um, and uh, thus, you know, as close as we're going to have to a big data, data set uh, on elections. And then finally, all the way to the left is Natalie Jackson, who's joining us. Uh, who's coming to us from New York. Uh, she actually lives in Hyde Park. Um, so, um, uh, and uh, she, uh, uh, she's been working with the, um, with the Huffington Post uh, to refine their polling techniques. Uh, she was previously working with the Marist poll. She has a PhD in political science, uh, but she's also um, done a postdoc at, from Oklahoma, but she's also done a postdoctoral work at Duke. Um, and she's really an expert on data science uh, and research uh, and, and polling methodology, and is going to speak to us a little bit about not just the Huffington Post uh, model, but the more general task of modeling elections. Okay, that was definitely more than I wanted to say, and so I am going to let each of our panelists give a few brief introductory remarks, uh, and, and then I'll open it up to a little bit of uh, exchange among us, uh, but mostly I would like to get out to you and to get your questions about this uh, imminent midterm. So thanks again for coming and enjoy uh, the event. So to my left, David Mayhew. Oh, but David will not start because we agreed. This is why you guys should have sat in the other direction. Natalie, <laughs> Natalie is going to start us off. Okay. So as you have probably seen, there are lots of people out there trying to predict which direction the Senate is going to go. Primary concern is the Senate because it, it's what could switch majority parties. The House, we all know, is probably going to stay Republican. In fact, the Republicans are likely to gain some seats, depending on which forecast you look at. Um, but the Senate is really up in the air at this point. If you look right now, we're four days out from the election. And across all the various forecasting models that are being put out by media organizations, the lowest, the highest 
percentage chance of a Republican takeover is the Washington Post with 93%, but everyone else is in the 60s range. So there's not a lot of certainty on what's going to happen. There are a lot of seats up for grabs. There's a lot of uncertainty in the modeling structures. Um, we have some challenges that are unique. Uh, the Huffington Post model says we have about a 63% chance of the Senate going Republican as of right now. That could change later this afternoon. Our model constantly updates every time we get a new poll. It'll rerun that particular state and put it back through the model. Right now it's about 63%. Um, that's been fairly steady for the last week or so. In fact, we've never, since we launched the model, we've never had either party as more than 60 to 65 percent certain of having a majority. So the moral of the overall forecasts is kind of flip a coin. We're a little bit better than a coin flip now, getting into the 60s, but a 60 percent probability is still, sig has significant room for things to go the other way. Some of the challenges that we face w with forecasting this that are unique to midterms and unique to this particular midterm are inherent in just looking at state by state probabilities. You know, trying to factor in polling, does the national mood matter? Does what people think of Obama matter? Um, some of the forecasts, New York Times, 538, Washington Post, they pull in some of these other factors. Uh, Huffington Post and Daily Kos and I believe Princeton Election Consortium models are polls only. We try to make some adjustments so that the polls only are reflective of what we think the environment is, but the idea is that the polling generally captures what the national mood is, so there's no need to add that in in a different stage of the model. We'll see who is right or we're all running pretty close right now so it's hard to say that anyone would be a definitive winner. On the polling side though we have some interesting questions of how do you predict turnout? How do you know who's actually going to vote? Um, in 2010 interestingly all of the polls significantly underrepresented Democrat turnout. So the average was 3.1 percentage points. In several of our really close races that Republicans are leading <coughs> right now, we're well within that margin. So if the polls are underestimating turnout in any systematic way, we could have very wrong forecasts. We're also dealing with a lot of changing demographics. You'll hear about these particularly in states like Colorado. <coughs> Um, we have issues with states that aren't polled very much, like Alaska and Kansas. They don't see much polling in an average year. And Kansas wouldn't have this year, except that at the beginning of September, we had a candidate suddenly drop out. So then everybody's scrambling to go into Kansas to poll. So are they as good at polling some of these other states as the states that are more commonly polled? And we do have pollsters that pop up and disappear. Um, one recently this cycle called Optimus showed up and we saw one thing and then we, we couldn't find any information about the firm and then they just disappeared. So we, we have a lot of things to con consider when we're looking at constructing this type of forecast and a lot of it is focused on the immediate context and figuring out how the immediate context is informed by patterns that we've seen historically, but yet allowing for the fact that it's probably going to be a little bit different. Um, so I'll wrap up there. Thank you, Natalie. Um, let me just ask one quick follow-up, because you said the difficulty of, of predicting demo what's going to happen with certain uh, um, sort of merging demographic groups, if you will. Is that mostly a contacting problem that we think that they're harder to reach, or is it just that we haven't factored that into our sort of historically based models? It's kind of both. Um, in Alaska, they're very difficult to reach. Um, that's one of the primary problems we see in polling in Alaska is getting to people. In Colorado, it, the discussion is about Latino voters, and in that case, 
it can also be a contact issue because of language barriers. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to start by saying two brief comments about voter turnout in this election. One about the United States Senate, one about the House of Representatives. Um, in the Senate, as we all know, there's about 10 Senate races that are close, which is, which is really amazing. About a third of the Senate is, you know, is up for grabs. I mean, a third of the elections that are contested are up for grabs. That, that's exciting. And if we get one thing wrong about these Senate races, it might be that we're getting turnout wrong, especially on the Democratic side. So uh, one thing that both parties agree about is that uh, the Democrats are better at the grassroots mobilization. Uh, through the Obama years, they've built up a big infrastructure, uh, good technology, a lot of volunteer capacity to do grassroots mobilization at the end of the election. Right now, from now until Tuesday, door knocking and, and things like that. And the, the important thing to know is people who right now or in the last six months are self-reported non-voters, meaning they pick up the phone and someone polls them and, and they're asked, are you likely to vote? They say no. Then the poll sa pollster says, okay, thanks very much, you know, goodbye, because we're interested in polling likely voters. Those people are not in samples, are not going to be in polling samples. So if the Democrats' advantage on uh, grassroots mobilization is real, and if they can use that to overcome a lack of enthusiasm for this year's election, then uh, th that those Democrats won't be showing up in the polls yet. And if we see... Um, come Tuesday, more Democrats winning than, than all of the polling is suggesting, this might be the main, uh, this certainly in terms of media, I think will be the main thing that folks are paying attention to and will indeed, I think, be an important component of what's going on. So if the polls are r wrong and Democrats do a little bit better than expected, uh, this might be the reason. Uh, what's interesting is the Republicans are the first to admit that they are weaker on, um, on this front. Um, if, if, of course, the, if, the, if the Republicans win by a lot, then, you know, I think we'll learn a little bit more about, uh, you know, even though, the, even though the grassroots mobilization efforts are really only supposed to get an extra one or two or three percentage points of the votes, it's really hard to overcome a lack of enthusiasm. So there might be a story uh, after the election about this. On the House side, as we know, like, no one's paying attention to the House. The House is totally uninteresting. The Republicans are going to keep it. So what is interesting about the House? I think the one thing to pay attention to that is interesting about this House is a fluke that happened in 2012. Right? In the most recent House election, we had a fluke. The fluke is that the Democrats got the majority of the House votes and lost the seats, right? So Democrats got 50.5 or something percent of the votes, but only 46 percent of the seats. This can happen in any legislature because the people are distributed in weird ways throughout the country so that some districts have very different populations in other districts. David and I were spending the last month or so going back and forth about this question, about when's the last time it happened. It turns out sort of a complicated uh, question. But uh, it happened a little bit in 1952, maybe happened in 1942. But it hasn't happened in a long time. And it is concerning. And it's concerning in part because of its relationship to gerrymandering and redistricting. Okay, so th the main reason why this kind of thing can happen in 2012, why we think it happened, is that uh, a lot of voters were coming out for the presidential election in, in uh, Democratic districts that were super highly Democratic districts, like majority minority districts, where um, you know, a huge percent of the electorate was voting for Obama and therefore for the, the House candidate on the Democratic side. And so the Democrats had a lot of wasted votes in these very safe seats, in part because Democrats are just concentrated in urban populations, and in part because in states that Republicans were drawing the district lines, they pushed a lot of Democrats into highly Democratic uh, districts um, in order to get you know, more seats across the country. So. Um, in 2014, is this likely to happen? Probably not, because we're not going to probably see as high turnout in, um, in, in the, the big Obama-supporting districts. But if it does happen, right, then we'll think more about the explanations related to gerrymandering. And so if, if there's, a, there's a repeat in Democrats getting, um, it, doesn't have to be the, it doesn't have to be more votes than seats, uh, like the majority of votes, but if they get, if, if the swing ratio, which is what we call the relationship between seats and votes, is out of whack by a lot, then I think there's more reason to be concerned about the relationship between gerrymandering and, and vote share and seat share in the House. So those are the two things that I would pay attention to on the House and Senate side. Thank you, Eitan. Um, I have a very quick question, which is, do you think that 
an offsetting factor um, given the Democrats' advantage in last-minute voter mobilization is the new wave of voter ID laws, or is that not going to really affect um, the elections this year? I don't think it's going to affect the elections this year because so far we haven't had a lot of evidence of decreasing turnout from the ID laws. And there is this hypothesis that the ID laws in themselves are mobilizing forces for the Democrats um, because Democrats get angry about them. Um, and the other thing is that we don't have, you know, where the, where the voter ID laws are going into effect suddenly, like in Texas, is not, you know, a state that we're that focused on. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. David. <clears throat> a little bit of history. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> uh, before Obama, we've had six presidents in the last century who served two full terms and therefore got elected the first time and then endured a midterm and then got reelected that endured a second midterm. These are Wilson, FDR, who actually served the third term. Wilson, as I say, FDR, Eisenhower, or Reagan, Clinton, and Bush 43. There are three Republicans and three Democrats. In all of these instances, the president who took over at the beginning of uh, the two terms succeeded a president of the opposite party. So in all cases, you get a fresh deck. So it's of some interest, at least for kicks, to see what the electoral history, and beyond that, the policy history is, of these two-term presidencies. Now, Obama, we're going to have presumably the seventh two-term presidency, but I'm talking about the six that preceded him. <clears throat> and uh, in all cases, if you look at party shares that the president's party enjoys in the House and the Senate, the record over the first through the second through the third through the fourth Congress, not surprisingly, is sharply down across all the four. There's another, it varies in its sharpness as it goes down, but it goes down. There's a slope across, and it doesn't differ by party. It goes down across these presidencies. And when you get to the fourth Congress, that is to say the Congress after the second midterm, which we're about to have another one of, in five of the six cases, a president is looking at a House and a Senate controlled by the opposition party. A House and a Senate controlled by the opposition party. The only exception in the six is FDR, who after his second midterm still did face a Democratic Congress, both House and Senate, but it was a miserable time for FDR after the 1938 midterm. I mean, the conservative coalition was largely dominating the Congress, and we had hostile investigations in the National NLRB of the of, uh, the, of communists in the agencies, the Smith Alien Registration Act, the Hatch Act, controlling what federal employees can do and so forth. It's a very grim time for FDR during that fourth Congress. So it didn't serve him an awful lot of good that the Democrats still held the Congress in that fourth, after that second midterm. So really, it's, it's, there it is. In, in five cases, the party she is in both houses go to the other side. In Roosevelt's case, it's grim anyway. Now, the history actually across the two terms varies somewhat, the electoral history, on the House side as opposed to the Senate side. And there's interesting variation there. It's down in both cases across the four Congresses, but there's interesting variation. On the House side, what happens on average, and you understand that this is average, you know, it's, there's an envelope there, no question about it. But if I took by this, this by the way, to Congress, to presidents, uh, a party controlling for six, eight years, even when it's not just one person and so forth, the, the pattern wouldn't differ that much. I'm just zeroing in on what I'm doing, though. Just for, uh, <clears throat> just for neatness, on the House side, what happens is the president's party tends to boot about, lose about 30 seats in the first midterm and then hold even and then lose another 30 seats in the second midterm. So there are two exercises of grimness for a presidential <laughs> party in the midterms. Midterms are just plain bad news for a president's party. In Obama's case, the Democrats already lost an exceptional number of House seats in their first midterm, so they're probably not going to lose very more. It's pretty close to the bottom of the barrel. There may be another 10, <laughs> maybe another 15 or so, but it's not going to be 30 that they're going to lose this time unless astonishing things happen during the next week which nobody expects. On the Senate side, it's different. On the Senate side, the President's party in the first midterm does pretty well as a president's party on average keeps as many Senate seats in the first midterm as they had going into the first midterm, so it's in pretty good shape going into its second Congress, okay? And then the president's party also stays pretty well, uh, I, I, it's, a, it's kind of an even keel in the president's reelect. So it's typical for a president's party to have pretty good Senate holdings in the first, the second, and the third Congress. But then what happens is that the president's party gets hammered in the second midterm. That's the history, that's the history. 
And this hammered as an average of seven seat loss, a seven seat loss in the second midterm over the previous Congress for the president's party. And there is, is a tricky reason for this as what happens in Senate elections will be dominated at least to some degree by the fact that these folks got elected six years earlier. So right now we're looking at Democrats who got elected six years earlier <laughs> when Obama took the presidency from the Republicans and had some coattails. You remember the 2008 election. So that exposes these folks now in 2014. And also for that matter, I'm not going to play it out, but the same kind of logic it obtains with the first midterm when the president's party does pretty well. I mean, six years before that was a presidential election where the opposite party took the White House and I'm not going to play it out. It's kind of complicated, but if you think about it, you can do it. So now the, actually come to think of it, the, the, the Obama party uh, in four years ago in 2010, actually they lost some Senate seats. They did, it was a bad year, you'll recall, in 2010 for the Democrats. Even though they took the, they kept the Senate, they lost six seats, which is not great. But on average over the, over the uh, you know, as I say, in this potted pocket history, you'd expect some losses. Now, of course, whether, they, whether the, whether the um, Democrats go under the water, we just don't know. We certainly don't know. But I would say at least it's a fair, fair to say that the holdings will go down, will go down into the, into the 50, somewhere near the 50-50 range. So the, somehow or ever, the, somehow the age of Harry Reid is probably over. I mean, if the Democrats lose four seats rather than seven or eight seats, still, it's going to be an interesting mess as organizing the Senate once the Senate comes in in, in January. You've got... You have renegade Democrats and independents, and I just can't imagine Joe Manchin of West Virginia conceding agenda control of the Senate if he's the marginal person who makes a Democratic majority plus Joe Biden come January of 2000 and, uh, 2015. There we are. The only other thing I want to say is this, to finish it off, and here the point is not just about what happened during these six presidencies, but about all midterms and all presidential elections, or all, all presidential year congressional elections, as well as mid-term year, mid year congressional elections since World War II. Somebody did a study, and I think this is authoritative, it looked right, of 1948 through 2004, asking the question, do Democrats do worse in congressional elections, on average, in vote, in vote shares in the midterm years than they do in the presidential years? The answer is no. There's no difference in the vote share, Democratic vote share in the congressional elections in the midterms as opposed to the congressional elections in the presidential years. There's just nothing, nothing there. There's also no relation over that half century period between turnout in the congressional elections or whenever they occurred and Democratic Party vote share. If there is a, reg this is a different point now, if there is a regularity out there, uh, that may be the following. This has been written about by Sam Grinnell, the political scientist. It's that in the midterms, there is an asymmetry in the midterms. It's that the antis tend to get more, more, more heated up than the pros. That is, the opposition party tends to get more passionate and get its people out than does the pro party that's got the presidency. That seems to be a regularity. At least it occurs often enough so that it probably affects what happens in midterms. That's it. That's a lot. Well, thank you, David. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I want to ask if any of the panelists, David probably accepted, although who knows, he may have more, um, wants to comment on any of the, the trends or, or issues discussed so far before I ask any more questions. Hey, Don? Natalie? Okay. So I think the one thing that, um, that we haven't talked about and mm -hmm. that I think everyone here would be interested in is what difference the election might make. So um, granting that we're going to see a modest loss uh, to, for Democrats in the House, and this question, the question remains of whether or not um, the Senate will remain in Democratic hands. And we might want to throw in here what is happening at the gubernatorial level as well. What do people foresee, um, and you can do this conditional on the Senate um, control, as the pattern of the next two years? Um, and David, of course, you can ground that in your, your historical uh, comparisons. So uh, Natalie, starting with you, what are your predictions? As far as the Senate goes, I honestly don't see that much will change, even if the Republicans do get the majority, simply because we still have a president that has to sign every bill into law. And there's a little bit of talk now that mm -hmm. a lot of the forecasts are settling in that the Republicans probably will take the majority, then the discussion kicks up, well, can they get to 60? 
and they can't. There's no, there's no statistical way that they can get to 60 seats. They'd have to have th at least three of the very heavily Democratic seats that are up for election completely flip. And the chances of that happening is well under 1%. So they're not going to get a supermajority. The, all of the leadership will change. We'll see different types of bills going through, obviously. But as far as things actually being enacted into policy, I don't I see any break in the gridlock that we've already seen. And as for, you mentioned the gov governor's side, that is probably an underrated place where we will see policy change. There are 12 very, very close governor's races right now. And some of them are in states you wouldn't expect. Connecticut's one of them. Um, Florida is running very close. Of course, you kind of expect that one. But a lot of these places that would be complete switchovers from what they've seen before. So that's probably the place, the state level is the place where I'd look for more policy change, depending on a lot of these gubernatorial elections. Great. I mean, this might be the obvious thing, but I think the, the most obvious um, and important thing that will happen depending on Senate control is the judicial appointments. Um, so probably no Supreme Court stuff happening in the next two years, probably. Uh, but a heck of a lot of appellate and district court judges that could be nominated. And those nominations will take a very different uh, flavor to them depending on who has control of the Senate, especially now we have the <coughs> nuclear or nuclear option depending on your party affiliation um, uh, in effect, right, where the, the Senate is, is, is putting through these nominations uh, without, without 60 votes. So a lot can happen. Uh, uh, in terms of Obama's long-term agenda uh, if the Democrats retain control of the Senate. And it's not clear what those judicial appointments are going to look like and what those confirmations are going to look like with Republican control. Um, I don't think Republicans will defuse the nuclear option. Um, they're going to keep the, 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 the current rules. I don't know what kind of judges. Yeah, I, yes. And I don't know what kind of judge, what what kind of judges Obama will get through. Uh, maybe we maybe in the audience have more judicial experts than I am, but I I, I don't know what that what will that would look like. The the only other thing that I'm attentive to is um, the the changing of the South and and you look at North Carolina, Georgia, places you know places where the Democrats might win, but they also just might retain seats. And there's certainly just more competition in these states than, than we've seen before. We have a lot of new migrants to this area. And uh, I wonder whether we know, we, we know partisanship is a pretty big pull in either direction. Um, but, but I wonder if, if um, Southern competitiveness will be a moderating force for any of the senators who are from kind of the, the north part of the South. <laughs> Excuse me, yes. <laughs> Back to my six presidents again briefly. There, there is, across them, there is, um, there, there, there is no instance of a president in his, they're all his, his fourth Congress, pursuing and getting enacted, getting enacted a domestic legislative program. It is a zero. There's just nothing there. Nothing. The, however, these uh, last Congresses have been, if you just look at the uh, items put on the books that are reasonably important, there's a, f a good deal of legislating that takes place. It's just it's, uh, not easy to predict what will come up during the two years. But compromise legislation of various sorts, like banking reform in, in Clinton's last Congress, or uh, they reorganized the railroads entirely in Wilson's last Congress, so on. Uh, Nancy Pelosi had a program in 07 08, which was Bush, Bush 43's last Congress. They raised the minimum wage in 1907, uh, 2007 2008. Democrats took to Congress and they did that, and Bush signed it in 2000, 2008, 7 to 8, and so forth. I think that uh, I think what I just said holds regardless of whether the Republicans take over the Senate. It's a pattern for last Congress is regardless of that. If the Republicans do take over the Senate, I think that agenda control makes a fair amount of difference. That is, I mean, 
the, the, the position taking um, cubed will come into effect um, with the with the Republican controlled Senate either to or try to enact things or to set up issues for the 2016 election or just plain to um, get the message across period in some general sense that will be there it's the um, the uh, yes I mean after all Harry Reid and this, this current Congress has muffled most disagreement on the Senate floor, most disagreement they would obtain anyway among Democrats, just, just shut down the Senate more or less. <clears throat> now it will either open up or be shut down in a different way. It might, if, 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 if McConnell becomes leader and wants to uh, ex exercise the same degree of agenda control, maybe he can do it if he can get around Ted Cruz, if he has a small majority, good luck dealing with Ted Cruz. Uh, he, but whether he'd want to do that, I don't know. He may permit some a little more openness in reaching things reaching the floor. Boehner did when he took over from Pelosi, a little bit more stuff reaching the floor, at least early on in 2000 and, 2000 and, uh, 2011. We really don't know. I would think the Republicans, if they do take over the Senate and they've got the House, then they, for one thing, they'll put their heads together and try to um, present themselves with, in a fashion that doesn't make them look uh, ridiculous. And uh, they'll do that, they'll, they'll muffle their folks. Actually, if Boehner gets some more seats in the House, that'll help Boehner's control of the House. And as they take over 10 or 12 seats, that would help. That is, uh, some of the folks coming in are pretty ferocious, the new Republicans, but still, some of the folks going out are pretty ferocious too. I would think if Boehner gets, Boehner gonna be very happy if he gets another eight or 10 seats, something like that, I would think it would help control. Um, I think that what they may do, what they're trying to do, what they're talking about doing, among other things, is to try to put some, through some uh, modestly important instruments that can get through the Senate and maybe the president would sign or have difficulty vetoing, like getting rid of the medical devices tax, for example. They're talking about that. I would guess they'd zip through in a hurry a, a, an enactment to, uh, to, uh, to build a Keystone Pipeline. I think probably uh, uh, Clinton, uh, Brent Clinton uh, Obama would veto that. Probably he would. If he didn't, Bill McKibben would have cardiac arrest. There's a, you, just, you have to veto the, the Keystone pipeline. There's too much pressure there from the, from the Greens, I think. But it would go on like that. I think, uh, th I mean, there is a range of issues on which a party controlling the Senate can pick up some <coughs> votes from the opposition. For example, the Bush tax cuts in 2001. They got up to about 60 votes. I mean, the Republicans had only 50, but I mean, they, they sweetened the whole business. There was a committee process, and I think finally they got about 60, didn't they, for the Bush tax cut? Something like that. I think we'll probably see some of that. Cheney you know? had to cast the decisive votes on the procedural matters, so they, they, they obviously weren't quite there. Um, they needed that, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, then um, hmm, we may get veto back and forth. I mean, one of the patterns is uh, veto games. We'll probably see that. But sometimes these veto games will do uh, emanate in some enactments. Uh, they, well, we'll just, we'll just have to see. But I think. <laughs> for, the, for the most part, the legislative course of the two years is unpredictable. If you look at any two-year period up front, you'll see that that's the way things are. Well, I, I'll add just two quick thoughts, and then I want to open it up. I mean, one is that um, whether or not the Republicans are capable of putting up these, um, these relatively popular or at least popular among big donors like the medical device tax um, issues is going to depend, I think, on the size of their Senate majority. It's, and, and so you're right, more seats for, for Boehner will be helpful. But also, I think they're going to have a harder time if they're really close um, to uh, 50 in the, in the Senate uh, coming up with, some, with things that can garner um, uh, a strong enough support from their caucus. Um, the other thing I was just going to say, maybe it's obvious, but um, and you might be able to tell me whether this is the historical pattern, but from the standpoint of the Democrats, it's not entirely clear that it's a bad thing to have the House and the Senate in Republican hands. Um, and obviously a lot would depend on w how those veto games play out, um, whether or not it's favorable towards the Democratic presidential prospects in 2016. So what does the history show on that, David? I don't know. I, I've seen some polling data back. I think um, John would know. I think there's some polling data that having it that presidents tend to ride higher in the polls if they've got an opposition Congress. The blame will get shared, or even after I think there's something. something but does that redound to the benefit of uh, in, party in the next presidential the party election? In the next presidential election. You know, I would guess not. I would guess that. It washes out. I would guess. I really don't know. I mean, they say that, Tr that Truman in '48 benefited from being able right. to attack the 80th Congress in '47, '48. Clinton in '96. I think probably that's overhyped hmm. with Truman in '48. I guess I really don't believe it that it made that much difference in Clinton '96. 
Um, well, there both sides got held. I mean, yes, Clinton did cooperative games with uh, Gingrich in that Congress of 95, 96, to the benefit, I think, of both House Republicans and uh, the Clinton Democrats in the White House, both of them. Yeah, that's an odd kind of um, right. positive game they there were doing there. There very uncooperative games at first. In 95, <laughs> but in 96, they switched to cooperation. Okay. Well, let's open it up and, you know, just please speak uh, clearly uh, for the video and, and for us. Um, and uh, I'll try to just call on people, and uh, so raise your hands if you're interested in asking a question. There in the back, yeah. I was wondering, um, what impact do you think immigration reform or the lack of immigration reform will have on the midterms? Can you restate the questions when you do it? Sure. Restate, He's wondering yeah. what, what impact immigration reform, or rather its lack, will have, might have on the midterms. None. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it seems to me that the parties are clearly positioned such that, say, Latino Americans know where the parties stand relative to one another. Democrats aren't making this a priority. They pretty much never have. Um, so, you know, it's a question of whether, you know, if, if the Democrats had put it on the agenda a little bit higher on the agenda um, earlier in the Obama years, would this have been a more of a mobilizing force for Latinos or not? Um, I'm not sure, yeah. Good question. Uh, right here in the front. Um, we're talking a lot about Democrats versus Republicans in terms of the control of the House, Senate, and so forth. Um, but we also see as part of the Citizens United uh, ruling that now, because there's more flush of money, um, perhaps we see people funding candidates according to their niche issues. I'm thinking like Tom Steyer, for instance, who's funding um, primarily Democrats who are willing to stand up for environmental issues. Can we talk about, play that narrative out a bit and talk about like how that might impact um, you know, the control in the Senate or who might get elected, whether for the midterms or in, in subsequent years? Well, I, I love the Citizens United ruling <laughs> because it's produced all this great you know, uh, advertising and, uh, and debate among candidates of different, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Citizens United is not, right, there's no donations to candidates. It's just people spending money uh, outside, uh, Democrats and Republicans both creating super PACs where they're trying to sell voters on their side. And uh, it doesn't, you know, I, I don't think we can point to any situation in this election or any, any election basically where, where uh, we can point to some outside group changing polls dramatically. Uh, but the two sides are competing and they're competing through these outside groups and, you know, for everyone's benefit. Uh, does anybody have a dissenting view on that? Um, first on the panel, then in the audience, so. No. Okay. My question was. Uh, and, and also, do, I mean, so in other words, Eitan, you don't foresee the ability of donors to kind of bankroll uh, candidates, you know, the Sheldon Adelson effect, if you will, as, as really changing anything fundamental about American elections. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, right. Because, because I think there's parity. And party platforms won't become less important as, like in other words, if Tom Steyer also started backing a Republican who was in a, a hotly contested district because that Republican was willing to stand for environmental issues uh, all of a sudden. So I'll just make one comment and then I'll go to you. You, you definitely want to say something. that. Parity in observed outcomes is not the same as saying that the people who run or the positions they take aren't influenced by money in politics, right? Because obviously, if um, if the if this affects recruitment <clears throat> processes or what issues candidates feel like they have to run on to get money, it's going to be you know beneath the surface an influence on the political um, arena. Um, and and then the other thing I would say is just that um, you know one wonders whether or not the so it's questioning the efficiency of a lot of this campaign spending um, but one wonders whether or not the incentives for candidates are so strongly to um, take kind of negative positions not towards not just toward their opponents but also toward the institution as a whole that that might not have some effect over the longer term as more money comes into politics but anyway yeah, you're I, I wanted to ask about the citizens united and the, all this outside money and the effect it might have on some of our traditional indicators of voter behavior things like turnout voter information willingness to respond to polls 
willingness to participate in campaigns. Are we seeing any evidence of effects on some of those indicators? Well, I can speak to the polling side of that. And we're not seeing anything specific that we can tie to Citizens United or funding. What the big focus in polling for response is the fact that people don't. Um, this is why you see such large debates in the polling and survey research world about method, how they're getting the interviews. If you're using phones, well, are you calling <laughs> cell phones? Are you calling enough cell phones? Because so many people are going cell phone only. Well, that gets expensive because the FCC says you can't auto dial a cell phone. You also can't robocall a cell phone. So anybody who uses robopoles can't do that. Um, switching to online is fraught with issues as well. You have, instead of asking people to take a survey, you have people that are opting in. So response rates are very low with all methods, practically, besides face-to-face, -face, where somebody walks up to you and says, please answer my questions. That's still a little more successful. But as, as far as that goes, the, that's where the focus is. I don't think we can narrow it down you know, when we only have five to nine percent response rates for most polls, I don't think it's really possible at this point to narrow it down to why people aren't responding, but it is an interesting question for sure. I'll just add that there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of studies of negative advertising on elections, and one thing that the super PACs do, similar to how the big party committees act, is that the candidates will, will have positive ads and they'll just say nothing in ads. One ad after the other is saying, you know, I care about education and the economy, and, but say nothing about policy. It's really in negative ads where you have some policy information. But John really is the expert on this, so maybe he should say something about it. But in general, if it's true that, poli that, that negative ads are a little bit more informative because they talk a little bit more about policy than positive ads, and I know there's some debate about this, um, it's the super PACs and the party committees that are running those negative those negative ads more. The only other thing I'll just add is that, right, if you're a candidate and a super PAC decides to run ads in your race, that's not necessarily great for you. There, there's some, there are some conditions under which that will be a bad thing. One is that you don't really trust this super PAC to do the right thing. You are not, you know, you don't know who they are. You don't, they care about some niche issue that you don't care about, and you don't necessarily want the election to be about that issue. So it's not necessarily great for the candidate. It's also, from the voter's perspective, um, you know, if you're in a standard congressional election where typically there are no ads run, because in most congressional elections there are no ads on TV, and then all of a sudden there's an influx of ads, um, you know, voters might be skeptical of who are these outside groups, who, why, why are there people focusing on us, and so I don't think, um, in, to, the, to the extent that super PACs, candidates, and parties are being strategic about their use of money and outside money in politics, they don't have a lot of evidence to you know, on which to be very strategic. So I would just say a couple quick things in response to that question. I mean, one is we do know that the, that the slight, as the money has become more, um, as the amount of money going into the elections has gone up. And, and really, for many years, I mean, you, you have, uh, you know, Ansel Bear, Snyder et al. wrote a piece, you know, back in 2000 where they showed that the trends were not that sharply upward. But since then, uh, there are sort of like like the, the standard political scientist writing about something just before it changes. You know, the Soviet Union will persist forever. Um, and, um, and so we're now catching up with the reality that there's been an enormous increase in the amount of money going in uh, to campaigns. And at the same time as that's happened, the share of that money coming from the top echelons of American society has also increased. So between 1984 and 2012, the share of campaign contributions coming from the top 0.1 percent, so the top one in a thousand, uh, households has risen from around 12 percent to 40 percent. Um, so that's a pretty <laughs> remarkable shift. Whether it, how it's changed um, the kinds of issues or, um, or positions that are taken is another, is another matter. The other thing I would say is just, in light, I, I think that's, that's probably true what Eitan's saying about negative ads having more information. And my point was only that, and I think this is more generally true and interesting, as sort of the valence of, of people's feelings towards political institutions grows more negative, the incentive to sort of degrade the collective good uh, of um, positive feelings towards public authority uh, increases. And so the negative ads are just part of that larger trend, I think, of running for political <coughs> institutions by running against political institutions. And 
I think, you know, underlying some of the political um, challenges we face today is, a, is basically a crisis of authority. Um, the difficulty of, 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 because of polarization, but also because of this um, cross-partisan um, uh, incentive to undermine um, the basis for, for, for legitimate public action, um, the, the sort of decline in, in, in general sense of faith in our political institutions. And the only other thing I would say is, I haven't seen a lot of good overtime data on this, but the polling really suggests that people are very negative about the amount of money in politics. Um, so um, political scientists <coughs> tend to be very sanguine, and Americans tend to be very alarmist about political money. And um, I wonder if the, the correct position is somewhere between the voters and the political scientists here. David, do you have a thought? <coughs> yeah, I do have a thought. If you look at the history of campaign finance reform, or efforts to achieve reform over a century and a half, it is a succession of palliations of perceived problems. And the problems have varied. In the problems. late 19th century, it was uh, uh, public officials getting fleeced by the parties. That was a problem, <laughs> which produced a bad bureaucracy, among other things. In the 20th century, uh, it shifted to, the problem shifted to corporations dumping money into politics. And that lasted most of the century. In the mid 20th century, there was a fair amount of worry about unions putting a lot of money into politics. But right now, it seems to be there's a big difference. It's, it's a billionaire's problem. And notice a billionaire's problem, or a perceived problem, is very different from a problem of corporations putting yeah. money into politics. Yeah, right. It's billionaires. And I think it, it seems to smell bad, that billionaires being able to put an awful lot of money into politics. So I would guess that give it 10 or 15 years, and this will get changed somehow. That is, that either through, through, through movement, through statutes, through new Supreme Court appointments, through constitutional reform, whatever. I would guess that the perceived billionaire's problem is going to get addressed. Nice. I, first of all, I have to say, palliations of perceived problems is, is the best alliteration we've had yet. Um, someone has to tweet that. Pulsimaneous palliations of perceived problems might even be better. Um, I'll only say, if you're interested in this question of uh, what difference that might make. So if money does have some effect in terms of influence, you might read the, um, the recent issue of, um, of Perspectives with the Bartels Page Seawright um, survey of the super rich in Chicago area, suggesting that they do, the rich are different from you and me. They're generally speaking more conservative. Um, so, um, but the rich who are donating, some of the prominent ones are actually quite liberal. Um, so it's overall, I think uh, perhaps somewhat more balanced um, than the uh, the modal position, say, of the of the American rich, if if we know what that is. Joe, and then I'll go to you. I have a question for David. <coughs> In the last midterm, you mentioned that, unlike other comparable midterms, the Dems did lose a few seats. In the Senate. In the Senate, yes, I'm talking about the Senate. Yeah. Do you think that this may, in fact, uh, alleviate the uh, magnitude of loss, if there is going to be any next Tuesday? I wondered about that. That's possible. Because after all, the figures are across the whole Senate, the whole hundred. So it's, it's possible something is something, yeah, so maybe, maybe. I don't know how to think about that. I mean, the intervals around what I'm talking about are so wide anyway, it's difficult to know. But I, it's an interesting question. Yes. There's talk of controlling for something like a national move, and I know that you don't, but others do. And the president's pretty pretty unpopular everywhere, I mean, with a few exceptions. But you see races like um, Gene Shaheen, Dan Malloy, races that, you, that shouldn't be close but are. And then you look at other races like Kay Hagan, yeah. um, Mark Pryor in Arkansas, that should be a runaway for Republicans but aren't. So if there isn't something that, that uh, you can capture like a national mood, is there anything systematic that you can add to a model that, that explains this variation? Or is it purely just state by state race by race. Is there anything national you can capture? So the question, David, is, is essentially whether or not we, I mean, there, there are actually two questions here, so I want to, I want to sort of um, trace them out. To, so one is a, is, a, is, a, is a modeling question, right? And, that dep and, 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 and the modeling question would be, do you need some variable for the national mood um, versus just individual polls? And, and I think that would partly hinge on the extent to which we believe, I mean, predicting election outcomes with polls is easier, obviously, than predicting election outcomes with, say, fundamentals like, you know, uh, 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 the state of the economy. Um, 
predicting, the question would be how much the polling is incorporating that national mood. Um, so that, that's a forecasting question. But the more um, analy analytically and politically interesting question is, is what's playing out in terms of a national mood this year? So whether it's getting incorporated into the local polls, whether you need another variable, putting that aside, what's going on? Um, you know, this seems like a pretty anti-Obama um, tide. Um, and yet you do see these states where, um, where Republicans are much more vulnerable than we would have expected. And yes, of course, we also see lots of places where, as expected, uh, Republicans are cr you know, crushing. So I'm curious what people think about what's the larger picture here. Natalie. Yeah. So it's interesting where these things are happening. Um, Eitan mentioned the South. Um, we have two major southern races in Louisiana and Arkansas where Democrat incumbents are likely to lose. So in that way you kind of see what you would expect shifting over to what is happening. You know, it's kind of amazing that you had the Democratic incumbent. Um, there are a couple of <laughs> other seats where um, South Dakota, West Virginia, and Montana where longtime Democrats did not run again or it's an open seat in some other way. So I'm showing you know 99% probabilities that the Republicans win. But then we have Georgia and Kentucky suddenly where the Democrats are competitive, including in Kentucky against McConnell. I would argue that race is basically over and that McConnell probably has it in hand, but it's been very competitive. So what's happening nationally is not necessarily uniform. Uh, and this is actually an argument in forecasting as well. You know, should we allow states to correlate? Well, in a presidential election, certainly, because you're combining everything to get to one estimate. But when we're talking about the Senate, do we expect patterns in one state to affect patterns in the other state? And I actually did some analysis on this in back testing our model in 2006 and 2010 and found moderate correlations between the states, but nothing really to make me think that I needed to build that into the model. As far as putting the fundamentals in, it's a, my question with fundamentals in a model and with any variable in any model is, does it actually make a difference? Does it make a fundamentally better, to overuse the word fundamental, um, does it make a better model? And I haven't seen all that much in the forecasting. I'm swayable. I'll show me the evidence and I'll look at it. Um, but I haven't seen that much that says that fundamentals are what control the prediction of the forecast. Even in the Washington Post model, the monkey cage model that John Sides and Eric McGee have put together, they have the fundamentals phasing out. So <laughs> over time, they had the polls gaining more and more weight in their model to, uh, I think their final split is 85-15. And 538 in New York Times, the other mo major models that included fundamentals did something similar. I don't know the exact proportions on theirs, but. So, so I just want to jump in there and say, I think that one reason that one, the reason I mentioned fundamentals wasn't whether they should be put in forecasting models. It was to draw us back to the distinction between a forecasting model and an explanatory or causal model, right? So um, it's rel relatively easy to predict revolutions when the armed um, revolutionaries arrive at the gates. Um, but it, and, and by the same token, it's relatively I'm not saying easy. I'm not going to do this. You do it much better than I do. But if we know what the polls are a week before the election, we, we probably could do pretty well in predicting the election. The the that doesn't that. But what's what's in what's influencing those polls is obviously the question, right? And right. Um, for 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 causal analysis. And um, and I'm not actually sure what the causal status of um, the what we call the fundamentals are in congressional elections. I, I tend to believe. 
from much of the forecasting stuff I've seen that doesn't include polls is that, that actually elect, uh, economic conditions aren't particularly good uh, in the midterm context as compared with the presidential election. So I, I was only, I just want to clarify that. So yeah, but I think that, and you may have a response. So I, I do actually. I, th I think that's an important point to make that um, with a lot of what goes on in the forecasting world, these are produced for media and public consumption. And what hasn't happened so far that I think we desperately need is the type of post hoc research. Mm -hmm. What works really well? You know, if somebody wants a dissertation topic, here you go. <laughs> um, what, what really works? Who's really doing the best or any kind of good job with these models? Um, we have evidence, you know back testing, et cetera, that I did that shows the polls are pretty good even about four to five months out. But we need that kind of research that would inform that question. David, you want to say something? <clears throat> yeah, two points. One is that I think Senate elections are to some degree like presidential elections or gubernatorial elections or big city mayor elections in that the they're quite candidate specific. After all, people, uh, there's a lot of FaceTime, there are television debates, people tend to know who the candidates are, so things, generally speaking, will attend to even out, or there'll be a lot of error, so to speak, in whatever you're doing in the way of modeling that, that will accrue to the, ca the characteristics of the candidates. I, I just seems right. I mean, take this year, for example. I mean, Jody Ernst is doing very well in Iowa, but the Republican candidates of Land and Webby and, uh, and uh, Michigan and Oregon are not doing very well. And everybody says quite credibly that it has to do with candidate characteristics. There it is. That's point number one. Point number two is that it's this. has to do with incumbency. And I'm not sure where I'm going on this one, but incumbency. <laughs> is, is it a help to run again as an incumbent? I think at the House level, the answer is on average, well, yes. I mean, it helps statistically. It helps you to win again if you run again as an incumbent. For example, I think one reason or carrying this out for this disparity, which uh, Eitan talked about in 2012 between the national House vote and national House seat winnings, is that the Republicans had a whole flock of people who were new who were running as incumbents and who benefited from that. I mean, it, 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 they won in 2010. Here, here are some statistics. In 2010, the Republicans elected a whole lot of new people. There are about 55 of those people who took seats from Democrats in 2010 and ran again as Republicans against Democrats in 2012. Okay, that's a lot of people. At the same time that the whole country was shifting between 2000 and 2012 in a Democratic direction in the National House vote by about 4%, among these 55, the National House vote was switching 2% in a Republican direction between 2010 and 2012, which means these people were working 6% against the trend as you go from one election to another, which is really something. I mean, incumbents, they can raise money, they can do stuff. Now, I think, I, I really don't know. I think maybe that doesn't work so well on the Senate side. I haven't seen anybody model this. Now, with House elections, Erickson and his folks at Columbia at modeling House elections have got, have got one instrument where they where they, where they take into account whether the House seats are open, that is to say, incumbents running again or not, that is they plug that into modeling. I haven't seen anybody done that, with, do that with the Senate elections. And just to confuse things, we really do know that Senate incumbents could lose. I mean, six, six year, year ago, a, a small carload of Republican <laughs> incumbents did lose six years ago to Democrats. We know that. We know that. On the other hand, Two years ago, in 2012, 32 Senate incumbents were on the November ballot. The only one who lost was Scott Brown, who'd never faced an even-year electorate before, Scott Brown. The, the, all the others, they racked it up in 2012. And in Arkansas, I mean, that, that probably would not be a close race this year if Pryor decided to take his pension. It probably would not be. Pro, pro, probably that's true. So I just said, no, I haven't seen this modeled on the Senate side. Yes. That's great. Um, yeah, Lori. I've always wondered if anybody has studied whether polls themselves end up influencing voter turnout or how people vote by having them see the polls and say, oh no, my candidate is losing, I'm going to go vote, or oh, my candidate's ahead by so much, I don't need to bother. There's a very recently published article, I believe it's by David Rothschild and Neil Mahatra, um, on exactly that. And I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing, had a few other things happening. Um, but from my quick skim of it, they're saying they do find evidence of that happening. It's not an overwhelming amount, but um, I would 
definitely look that up because people are very actively looking into that right now. I'll just add one little factoid, which is a while ago, 30 years ago, there was a state senator in California named Karabian, I think was his name, who, who proposed a state law to, that you weren't allowed to publish polls <laughs> ahead of the election so that voters wouldn't be influenced by the polls. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not a constitutional thing to do. But, um, <coughs> but, um, but yeah, that was, that was there, uh, people have been concerned about that for a while. Uh, great. That's yes, up here on the right. There are, uh, there's probably always, but a couple prominent Louisiana Senate and the main governor where an independent or third party candidate is a factor, a major spoiler factor. What trends are there and predictions you may have for people voting for other than the major parties? Well, that's <laughs> a question I've been looking at a lot in the last couple of weeks, primarily dealing with Georgia's yeah. Senate race. Mm -hmm. Um, it looks like the Libertarian candidate is pulling just enough to make that not, to make Purdue, who's leading, or none, either one of them could take it. It's going to prevent either of them from reaching 50%, and Georgia does have that 50% threshold, as does Louisiana. Um, Louisiana is a little bit more complex because of the jungle primary, um, where everybody's running at once. But um, we certainly see it in Georgia, and the outcome there is basically that right now, as it stands, Nunn's chances would be better if she could win on November 4th. Um, when we go to a runoff situation, things tilt a little bit more toward Purdue. And we actually, I built a calculation at the end of last week to calculate the probability of a runoff and the probability of a win. And it stays on Purdue's side both ways right now. And we're looking at about a 56% chance of a runoff. Mm -hmm. um, the other case is Maine, which had actually had a little movement yesterday where the third candidate said, basically, vote your conscience. Um, because it was kind of the realization that he's pulling votes away from I believe it's the Democrat. I'm not an expert on Maine, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so that has the potential to throw a race. Kansas was a big deal this year. Um, I think we all know the narrative there. So we're, we're seeing, actually, it feels to me like more of that, this cycle, where the third candidates are spoilers. Yeah, we have a little bit of it here in Connecticut even. Um, Though I think rhetorically Malloy is hurt by the third candidate, but I think politically Foley is. Um, there, any other questions? Yes. Um, so of the potential new candidates to enter the House or the Senate, who do you think would be the most interesting or potentially have the most impact in some fashion? Well, it's interesting new candidates, he said. You know. Yeah, interesting new candidates, David. What do you think? I, was, I mean, or, you know, Orman is this weird case. So, the, so the, this is a Kansas, right, where mm -hmm. it's a, it's a non-Democrat who's running against the Republican and hasn't committed to which party he'll caucus with. And there's a good chance that, you know, come Wednesday of next week, no one had any idea what's happening. And a lot of attention will be focused on which party Orman's going to caucus with, uh, which makes him interesting in the immediate future, but also long term if he's going to be kind of a rogue a rogue entity. Uh, in terms of colorful candidates, new, new, new members of the Senate who will be interesting to watch. I mean, we don't have any Ted Cruz's coming in, do we? I don't, I don't think so. They're pretty, no bomb throwers. Boring. I think <laughs> one to watch would be, nobody pays any attention to this guy, Ben Sass of, of, of Nebraska, who's going to be a Republican senator, replacing a Republican. We're not even watching that race. But he's a very interesting character, a college president, very talented. And possibly ambitious, <coughs> I th yes. Uh, I, by the way, uh, new, uh, new, new senators, there'll be a lot of, regardless who takes the Senate, there'll be a lot of new Republican senators. I, I looked in it the other day, there'll be maybe in double digits, new Republican senators where there may be very few new Democratic senators. It has to do with retirements and such. I, I will say that the one thing uh, to pay attention to among those Republican senators is um, Rand Paul-ish foreign policy. 
uh, because not much is going to happen in the Senate <laughs> domestically, but the Senate will have some things to say about foreign policy. The presumed Democratic nominee on the Democratic side is the most hawkish person to run for president on the Democratic side in a long time. And so uh, both as a matter of differentiation and because it's interesting, the Republicans are going to have a debate about this. And and um, no one, I don't think that there's not a lot of serious consideration to Rand Paul being the next eventual Republican nominee, but there's, um, there's a heck of a lot of room for him to get support from people who are uncomfortable on both sides with the hawkishness of Hillary Clinton. Any more questions? Yes, John. I just wanted to return to the, the money point just a little bit and get, maybe state a conjecture and get the, the panel's thoughts on this. So money's only really valuable when, where a campaign, or when a campaign's expensive. And so one thing that's changing is that most, or much of the advertising currently on TV may shift to other sources like the internet, where virtually it's pretty costless to reach people, but admittedly the effects may be small. Um, so I'm wondering if we, we should be worried about money in that sense or money in another sense, which is candidates, not candidates, but outside groups, influencing elections in other ways, like get out the vote efforts, targeting particular places where they may have partisan supporters in higher numbers. I mean, th yeah, this is not, yeah, my, the, my view on this is not about, gi given the evidence, my view is just that the more the merrier. <laughs> the, I, yeah, I don't see any reason to be concerned about this. Both sides are using a lot of resources to try to influence elections because they care about elections and there's lots of different kinds of groups. The Billionaires Club who's engaging in politics is really a diverse set of people who care about specific issues and some care about the environment and some care about gay marriage and some care about pi pipelines and you know they're all trying to engage with the electorate. I, this is just and isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> Based on personal observation, um, I live in a swing district in New York at both the congressional and the <clears throat> local levels, I can't log into Facebook without being inundated with ads. I don't think I've seen a non-political Facebook ad in weeks. And so I, I think the more powerful place for that, like I said, the, I've done no research on this at all, but it seems to me like the more powerful place for that would be the local races, our state senate races basically being played out online. Um, John, I have one more thought, which is given, I think they're very steeply diminishing marginal returns for uh, spending. Um, and I, so I think your conjecture is right, that as, as, as if campaigning, if, if the options, if television advertising is, is less and less effective, money's going to go elsewhere. But the other thing is to think about groups going for lower hanging fruit. We heard there was this Times series, or uh, Times piece on the Attorney General's um, you know, the way in which the Koch network is focused on state legislators seems interesting to me there. So Veshla has been writing, oh, well, Veshla is here, but yeah, she left. Uh, she's, Veshla Weaver has been writing a little bit about this. So I would expect another thing you're going to see is not just other ways of spending money, but more and more thinking about, okay, what's the pipeline of candidates? How do you influence lower level policy developments? Uh, you know, how, how, you know, the first wave of this was really about how do you influence state legislators so you can affect re, uh, redistricting. But, you know, there's a lot of other things you can, you can do. There are a lot of nodes of power in the American political system, and, and a lot of them have until recently had almost no money and very little um, um, non-financial political activity. And I think that's changing. <coughs> and that, that will contribute to the nationalization because much, much of this is going to be coming from groups that are aligned with kind of the national political cleavage. Um, I feel as if we should probably uh, wrap up. David has a thought, uh, and then I have a, a closing remark. So, Very brief thought. And uh, back to John Dearborn, an interesting new character is possibly <coughs> coming in. Another one is Tom Cotton of Arkansas, if he wins. So I think Tom Cotton of Arkansas, Ben Sass, that's SASSE -S -E of Nebraska, who may both be new Republican senators, are especially talented and ambitious people. That is, I think we may be looking at folks who want to do better than the Senate in those instances. I'm a little shaky on what Sass is up to, but I think maybe that's right. So we'll, we'll keep our eyes out for them. Uh, we'll think about uh, uh, this, these wonderful perspectives as we watch the, the races unfold uh, before November 4th. 
And I think it's pretty fair to say, I'd wanted initially to do an election night event, but uh, given the current forecast for um, recounts and the like, I think it's probably a, a good thing that we're having this in advance because it may be a very long night and actually several days. Um, so in this not, I hope, very long uh, seeming uh, exchange, I think we've, we've gotten a great preview of what to look for both during and after the election. I want to thank, and I hope you'll join me in thanking this wonderful group uh, of panelists.